Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at Viceroy from Mayday Games and Hobby World. Again, <laughs> as the title of this review suggests, this is a revised version of a review that I put up about four or five days before this review is going up. And the reason for that is because the first few times that I played Viceroy, I got a major rule wrong, and I went ahead and published a review without double checking the rule book ahead of time. And hence, that rule uh, mistake influenced my opinion in a hugely negative way. Uh, now, here's the thing I have made mistakes in rules before. I mean, obviously, some of the games that I review are really complicated games, and unless I am literally sitting there reading from the rule book as I do the overview, something is going to get messed up. Some little thing is going to get messed up. I published a review uh, around this, just the same time as Viceroy for the Voyages of Marco Polo. It was a very positive review, and someone pointed out that during the overview, I messed up the amount of camels that each player gets at the start of uh, the game. whoop de doo that's, that's not a huge deal. I, I regret that I didn't get it right, but it didn't change the review at all, or, uh, and we played it correctly as well, so that was like no big deal whatsoever. However, for Viceroy, the rule that we got wrong, and I'm not going to go into the details of it here, I'll talk about it in my final thoughts because it won't make any sense to you until you see the overview. The rule that we got wrong was such a big deal that it completely changed my opinion of the game. I specifically point, it, it was a mostly negative review, my original Viceroy review, and I pointed out three specific things that I thought crippled the game, that are completely wiped away by playing the game correctly, which I did once I realized what a, uh, someone on Board Game Geek pointed out the mistake that we made, and I was mortified and embarrassed and felt really, really sorry about it. So I want to first say, before we go any further, I humbly and heartfully and all kinds of other adjectives apologize both to the publishers, Mayday Games and the Hobby World, for publishing a negative review that was completely misinformed, but more importantly, I think, to the fans of my channel, because I know that a few people who commented on my original review were saying things like, man, I'm really disappointed. I was really looking forward to this game. I was very excited about it, and I didn't know that it had these crippling problems. But these people were only going off of what I said in the review. And I'm always shocked by the amount of trust that people put in me, and it's really, really humbling, and I always try to live up to that trust, but this is definitely an instance where I completely failed. So I'm very embarrassed by that, and I feel very badly about that, and I, that's one of the reasons why I thought that the least I could do was, first and foremost, take down the old review. You can't find it anywhere. It's deleted. It's gone from my hard drive. But also to publish this new revised review, which... Uh, in my overview and my final thoughts will fix that rules mistake. I'll teach the game properly, hopefully, and I'll give you my real final opinion, which is significantly different than the opinion I had in my original review. So just to sum up, I'm very sorry. I will try my best not to let it happen again. Now, moving on, if you're not, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, if you're not familiar with Viceroy, this is a competitive game that's set in the world of Berserk War of the Realms. And I think you'd be forgiven for not knowing what that is. It's, I'm not talking about the anime Berserk. <laughs> there was a card game some, somewhat similar to Summoner Wars put out in Russia that was huge in Russia. And it was released in Europe, the rest of Europe, and in um, uh, the United States last year. But it didn't really have much of an impact. But this is set in that same world. And unlike that game where you're battling with different units... This is more of a political game. You are trying to put your nobles into power. Now, in gameplay terms, it's kind of abstract. You're trying to build a pyramid of cards, get different resources, score points in a variety of ways, and so on. Let me go ahead and give you a brief overview of how the game plays correctly this time. Then we're going to come back and I'll give you my real final opinion. All right, let me run through Viceroy. This is your typical setup for a two to four player game. Um, I'll just assume that there are other players who have 
a shield off around the sides of the table. The, the game kind of has a big footprint because of the pyramid that you're building, so I'm only going to show you what it looks like from one player's perspective. Now, this game uh, is mostly for two to four players. However, it can be played solo. I can't comment on that, however. I have not played the game Solitaire, but there are special rules for that. The other thing I need to mention is that I'm using some optional things here. I have optional card sleeves, a playmat that does not come with the game. You have to purchase that separately, as well as actual plastic gems instead of the uh, tokens that uh, typically come with the game, which are just cardboard tokens of the different colors, similar in uh, size and quality to the other tokens that are present in the game. So I'm just using the optional stuff just to show it off on camera, but that stuff is extra. I can tell you right now, it does not affect the gameplay at all. The, the uh, playmat is nice to have, but it is not strictly necessary. And the gems, actually I'm kind of torn as to whether the gems are better or worse or just exactly the same as the cardboard tokens, but just something to keep in mind. Now the goal of Viceroy is to have the most points by the end of the game. The game is going to last 12 rounds. Um, and the points are going to be in, in a variety of different ways. We're going to get to all of that. But let me just run you through uh, the basic components and the gameplay. You have a ton of different tokens in this game. You have a, uh, attack and you have shield tokens. They are double-sided. So um, there's a finite supply of every token, by the way. Um, whatever t token you happen to be talking about, whenever it runs out, it runs out. There are no substitutes. And in fact, you use a different amount of gemstones depending on the number Number of players. In a four player game, you'll use all of them, but you'll use less in other player counts. You have bonus tokens. You have bonus tokens for um, completing circles and getting infinite bonuses. I'll explain all that as well as bonus tokens for the magical scrolls. The magical scrolls, by the way, are on double-sided tokens together with science. So that's another finite resource, um, and both of them are used for the same thing. You flip whatever side that you're using, you flip it up and put it onto the character cards, which we'll get to. And then you have a bunch of different victory point tokens of different denominations. These are not double-sided. Um, and victory point tokens are straight-up victory points. That's the easiest type of victory condition to explain in the game. Now, at the start of the game, every player is going to get a character shield. There's a different character on the outside of each shield, but it, it has no effect on the gameplay. You just have a, a cheat sheet on the inside. You're also going to get two gemstones of each color in the game, green, blue, yellow, and red. But then you randomly put two back into the supply. So you're only starting with six gem gemstones of indeterminate color uh, until you, it is determined and you know what they are. Uh, and then you're going to hide those behind your shield. The only other type of token you will ever hide behind your shield are specifically the sword tokens. Uh, then you're going to have the uh, law deck and the character card deck. This requires a bit of special setup. You're going to use exactly 48 cards in the main deck of character cards. Then the leftovers are going to be the small deck uh, card deck. Also, each player at the beginning of the game, before you do all of that shuffling to Together is going to get four cards, four of the character cards, of which they're going to choose one to play right away as the start of their pyramid structure, and also they're going to get the bonus right away. So in this case, let, let me go ahead and just show you that right away, what the character cards look like. There's a uh, surprising amount of things going on here. You have the art and the name. There's a number down in the corner, which only matters for breaking ties. Um, whenever characters are uh, trying to set off uh, effects at the same time, whoever has a lower number is going to be able to break the tie. You have these circles and partial circles around the edges of the card. Well, they're all partial circles, but you have a half circle and then quarter circles. I'll explain that in a moment, but that's important for scoring. Then you have different rewards. Each reward uh, corresponds to a different level where you build the card. So at the beginning of the game, this is the start of your first level. So therefore, you're only going to get the first reward down here. And you don't have to, if I'm getting this correct, you don't have to pay for this when you build at the start of the game. But from then on... If you were to build on the first level, you'd have to put the card into place in your in your row, and then you'd have to pay, in this case, a green gem. If you try to put it in the second row, you have to play another green gem, and then another one. You have to pay for every row uh, before the one that you built. But, and this is the rule that I got wrong in my first review, you only get the rewards for the current tier. So if I built this card on the third row, I'd have to pay a red a green, and another green, but I would only get this reward, which happens to be drawing a card. If I built this like I am about to do in this example, on the first row, I get a two-point victory chip, and the gray circle means I get two victory or two gemstones of any color of my choice behind my screen. 
The other symbols here are scrolls, but coincidence is the same thing, just more for the fourth reward. So I would get two scrolls, or I would get one scroll, depending on where I built this. And there's special rules for the fifth row, which I'll get back to in a minute. Uh, so in this case, I get to take a two-point victory chip, and I am going to put that right on the suit. Wow, I just knocked over my screen. I'm going to go ahead and put that right on the uh, my character card, and then I'm going to take the gemstones of my choice. Let's just say, to make it quick, I'm going to take two blue ones. And as soon as I pick it up, I'm going to put that behind my screen. Now, the law cards are a little bit different. You're going to start with three of these. Remember, you start with one character card in, uh, in play, then one you're going to hold on to. You'll start off with three random law cards. And law cards have a variety of different effects. You see that they have the partial circles, just like the character cards, but they don't have reward levels. You'll never have to pay for law cards. You always can just place them however you can't place it in your fifth row. And they'll give you different things. A lot of the cards are just giving you a choice of some type of resource or bonus to take. So this one says you can take a shield, or you can take a victory point chip and put it on this card, or you can just take four gemstones of your choice from the reserve. But a lot of them have to do with endgame victory points. So Common Law Marriage here says that at the end of the game, you gain two victory points for each adjacent character card and up to six cards can be adjacent. Uh, Royal Favor here says that you put a free card from your pyramid underneath this card, move all tokens, if any, from the free card onto this card, and at the end of the game, you get a varying amount of victory points depending on where this was built. There's other cards that say keep stowing cards underneath this card and you'll get victory points, or put a bunch of gemstones on this card and you'll get a ton of victory points, and so on and so forth. So I'll go through a rundown of the game, but let me just go ahead and explicitly explain what each of the different types of tokens are. I already explained victory point tokens. That's pretty self-evident. The swords and shields. Each sword is going to do one of two different things, and you choose how you're going to use it. You put it behind your screen because you can choose to use this during the auction phase in order to automatically win a bid, in which case you expend it. But if you hold on to it until the end of the game, you're actually going to be able to attack quote unquote, the other players, and make every other player lose four victory points for every sword, unless you have shields in your pyramid. And if you have shields in your pyramid, each shield is going to cancel out a sword. Otherwise, the only use they have is for making different sets in order to get points, which I'll get back to in a minute. Uh, then you have the magic, or I just call them scrolls, and science tokens. Now, the scrolls by themselves are nothing. They're worth nothing on their own, except in those aforementioned sets that I said. But you will get a certain amount of points based on the bonus tokens that you have that apply to the Magic Scrolls. And these come in different amounts that uh, the cards will grant you. Uh, every one of these bonus tokens gets applied to every single Magic Scroll you have. So if you have a uh, plus 5 Magic Scrolls uh, bonus token and a plus 3, that means that every one of your scrolls will be worth 8 points at the end of the game. So on their own, they're worth nothing, but they could be worth a lot. The Science, however, does have a use during the course of the game. Every science token that you have in your pyramid means you get an extra uh, gemstone when you pass during the auction again, which I'll explain uh, momentarily. So that can be pretty important. Now I'll explain that for every science, shield, and scroll you have in your pyramid at the end of the game, a set of all three, a complete set, you get an additional 12 points. The last type of token I'll explain are the circle bonuses. That is because you can make completed colored circles in your pyramid as you build up and up. Let me explain how the building works. So let's say that this, let's see if I can get a good example here. Here we go. In order to build a card on top of another card and therefore make another a second row, you have to have two cards underneath it. And this stays true all the way up to the top of your pyramid. So I can build this level two card, but then if I want to, I have to expand my base in order to continue to go outward. Now, if by expanding and building cards here, I'm actually able to connect circles and make a full colored circle, all of one color. If it's of different colors, it's nothing. In other words, this is already the start of a bad circle and that will never be able to be complete. But if I'm able to make a full color circle, a couple different things happen. First and foremost, you immediately are able to take the applicable gemstone from the supply as a free bonus. So in this case, I'd get a red. Boom, got that. But another couple things, scoring at the end of the game, you get points equal to whatever the top card is in your pyramid or where it is. So in other words, if this is in the second row and it completes this red circle, I get two points for that completed circle. That's where the bonus chips also come in. If I had a red bonus uh, circle chip, I would get an additional four points for every completed red circle I have at the end of the game, in addition to the points that they're already worth. 
This bonus point uh, chip also applies to infinite gemstones. Now, I don't have an example of infinite gemstones out here, but there's one actually. The infinite gemstones are one of the reward levels where it looks like a normal gemstone, but it's got an infinity loop on it, as opposed to these gray gemstones where you just take whatever you want. This one says that you put that colored gemstone out on the card. Uh, just so happens that is the second reward, and let's remove that because that's probably not the right reward. Then I would put a gemstone there permanently. Once per development phase, when I'm building cards here, I'm able to use that gemstone towards the cost of building one of these cards. And this bonus, even though it doesn't look like it, applies to the infinite gemstones as well. Because at the end of the game, you get a, a same thing with the completed circles. You get a number of points equal to where it was built. So in this case, I'd get two points because it was built in the second row, this infinite gemstone. And an additional plus four if I had this token somewhere out in my pyramid. So now that I've given you information overload on the scoring, let's talk about how the game actually plays and hopefully it'll make a little more sense. Uh, the game is going to be played in two main phases. Again, you're going to have 12 total rounds of this. The first phase is bidding. So let's go ahead and put these cards back where I originally found them or approximately, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so it'll be like that. At the start of every round, or actually in at the beginning of the game, you're going to have four out here. Once you've done the auction phase, uh, any cards that are left over in the what are called the first chance auction spaces are going to immediately move up to the top of the second chance, and then the bottom row is filled again. This is If you don't have a playmat and a way to keep track of rounds, this is how the rounds are kept track of, because there's exactly 48 cards in the main deck, and you'll put out four every single round. So the round that you pick the last of the cards from the deck will be the last round. How the auction phase is going to work, you notice that there are... There's actual cards for this, but um, I actually have the play map, but there are cards if you don't have the play map that you put out, and you put them out randomly, although it doesn't really matter. Each one of these gemstones corresponds to a card. So if I wanted to bid for this particular card, I would have to bid a red gemstone, and that's what you do in secret. You take a gem of the applicable uh, space that you want to take the card from, and remember that when you get to second chance auctions, there could be more than one card associated with a space. But I'll take the gem that I, of the space that I want, hold it out when everyone has made a decision. You open your hand, and if this was the case, I would do red, and say, boom, that's the card that I want. And now some things can happen. If everyone chose a different gem, no problem. Everyone takes the applicable card into their hand, reset the whole auction block, you move on to the development phase, which is the next phase. If more than one person put out the same colored gem, and there is only one card associated with that space, well, regardless of what happens with your bidding, the gem is going to be discarded. Um, even if you win the bid, it goes back into the reserve. But in this case, everyone discards their gems because more than one person chose the same thing and nobody gets anything. Then you go to a second auction out of a total of three auctions. The other, But if there is more than one card associated with the space and only two people chose to go for that space, those players haggle over which card they want to take and which one they're willing to let the other player have. Then if no one can come to a decision, the gems are discarded and you do it again. You can also say whatever you want before you actually uh, choose and reveal the gem that you want, but you are not bound to any kind of decision. You can say, yeah, I've got a blue gem in my hand. Yep, definitely going blue. Huzzah, what's up, sucker? You could do that if you want to. That's totally up to you. Some of the haggling that's involved in the game. The other possibility is that you hold out an empty hand or it gets to the third auction and there's still a stalemate and there are still one or more players that can't seem to grab a card. If you purposefully choose to abstain from voting or from bidding or if it just happens after three auctions that you've reached your limit and you still haven't gotten a card, then you get compensation in the form of three gemstones from the supply unless you have the science tokens. And that's where the science tokens come in because then you're going to get an extra one for every science token you have in your pyramid of your choice. And remember, those are finite. So if there's a tie and more than one person is getting compensation at the same time, you have to look at the lower, lowest numbered card in your pyramid. Once everyone has gotten something for the auction and it has been reset, then you get to the development phase. Each player can build a maximum total of three cards per round, and you do this simultaneously. Everyone decides whether or not they're gonna build or not, and everyone flips over their card, places it into their pyramid at the applicable space, pays for it, gets their rewards, and then you go on to possibly pay playing a second card as well, until every player has run out of cards to play or has just passed and decided they are not going to build anything. If Remember, if effects are happening at the same time and they're gonna conflict with one another, it's whoever built the lowest numbered card. 
And that's how the game is going to continue. Once every player has had a chance to build, we go back to the auction phase, auction again, and then the build again. And you're going to do this a total of 12 times, getting rewards each time. Let me try and make my pyramid look more impressive just to illustrate this. Because there's one last thing I'll explain, and that's what happens when you get to the fifth row. So you see I have to constantly be building up my pyramid and making it bigger and better in order to play more and more cards. So let's say I'm not really paying attention to anything that I'm doing in particular. I just want to illustrate this point uh, and actually make a pyramid so you have an idea of what it will look like as you continue to build upwards and ever ever onward. So let's say I want to build this, my fifth, by coincidence, this is the card I built at the top of my pyramid in the last game that I played and won. But uh, this, let's say that this is, I want to build this as the top card of my pyramid, the fifth level card. Theoretically, you could build more than one fifth level card, but it's extremely hard to do because it takes a lot of time. In order to, let's go ahead and zoom in on that particular example. In order to build that in my fifth row, something special has got to happen here. You have to pay for every single row as you normally would, in this case, the first four rows, but you also have to pay double for the last row. So I'd have to pay a total of one yellow, one green, one red, and then another two yellow in order to build this card in the fifth row spot. Then something weird happens. You have two different options. One of them is that you ignore everything on the card and you just take a 15 point chip like this. Boom, done, ignore it. If you completed a circle, you'd still get that, but you don't get any of the other rewards. You just get that 15 point chip, which is a fine prize. But let's say that you really want those other, uh, some of those other rewards instead, like in this case, a couple more cards and um, a scroll bonus. Well, in that case, instead of taking the 15 points, you can instead choose to get the first three rewards on the card. Not the top one, just the first three. You will get all three of those. This is the only instance, except for special law cards perhaps, where you would get every single, we get more than one reward. Remember, you cannot build law cards in the top spot, however. And that is a hasty or perhaps overlong overview of Viceroy. Try to get as many different types of tokens, build as many character cards, and complete circles, and use law cards. Lots and lots of different scoring, and also they gave you a scoring pad in order to become the best Viceroy, I guess? Okay, let's get to my final thoughts. All right, the theme of Viceroy is not really there. This is mostly an abstract game, as I kind of mentioned in my intro. Uh, you're just building a pyramid and getting sets of stuff and getting different types of tokens. I never really felt like I was maneuvering for political power, which I think is supposed to be the theme of the game according to the rules and according to the back of the box. Uh, but that's okay. Um, it's especially okay given the fact that as far as the components go, it's a gorgeous game. That artwork is phenomenal, as it was, I think, in the game it's based off of, or the game that it's a spin-off of, Berserk War of the Realms. It just looks fantastic. This is some of the best artwork I have ever seen, period, let alone in a board game. And the rest of the graphic design is pretty solid as well, up to and including the box. Um, as far as actual physical component quality, all the tokens are fine. There's a ton of tokens in this game, so you kind of have to get over that. And I wish that they weren't double-sided, I know that there's a whole scarcity of resources thing with that, which I'll mention a little bit more in a minute, but still it's just kind of annoying to have them be double-sided, but okay, whatever. The only major thing I problem I have with the components is just the screens. They're very small, they're very flimsy, they tend to flop over a lot. They're just not a very good quality. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's not like the, the end, it's not like an end of the world type thing, but it, I wish they were a little bit better uh, in that regard. The optional playmat I showed that you can purchase separately, I would say it's unnecessary. It's okay, it's fine to have, but you, since you already have those setup cards, you know, and they're kind of superfluous if you have the mat, I mean, one way or the other, you'll be fine. I don't think you really need to play mat unless you just really have to have it. As far as the gameplay goes, well, let me tell you first, now that you've seen the overview, what we got wrong <laughs> that carried over to my initial review. And that is that when you build a card in a row, no matter where that row is, you're only supposed to get the reward for the level that you're building on. We were playing that you got every reward beneath it. Now, that's a big deal, but you might say, well, that's not like a huge deal. No, it's a huge deal because the three major criticisms I had um, in my initial review were the length of the game, the scarcity of resources, 
and the fact that one path to victory was apparent, and that was going after the scrolls. That rules mistake and playing the game properly wipes out those three complaints. You wouldn't think it would affect the length that much, but really the game was very, very fiddly playing as the rules as we did them because everyone's getting a ton of stuff every time. You're constantly having to check the stock of things and there's just tokens flying everywhere because everyone's getting a whole pile of things when they build on like the third, fourth, or fifth row. Uh, well, fifth row wasn't really, we didn't really screw that up that badly. We did screw up the, that rule because we thought it was the first, um, the, the last three rows that you got instead of the first three, but nevertheless. Um, so that, the length has definitely helped when you play the game correctly. Uh, the other thing is the scarcity of resources. Obviously, if you're not getting a pile of stuff from every card that you play, then the scarcity of resources is not as big of a deal. It is still an issue. There were still situations where, because the, uh, for instance, the first game that we played correctly, we it was a three-player game and you have less gems than you would in a four-player game. Uh, and again, with two players, you have even less. And there were situations where people purposely went after certain colors of gems and made them scarce to keep other players from getting them. So that is a thing but it happens less frequently with the item tokens, like the science and the scrolls, uh, because you're only getting one thing. Previously, there were cards that gave you, uh, at one reward level, a scroll, at another reward level, another scroll, and at another reward level, a bonus for the scrolls. And that was huge and um, game-changing, and also made there be less scrolls out there for other people to grab. You just gained a ton of stuff there. So playing the game properly, fix that. And then lastly, what I just alluded to, science I thought was the way to go. Like if you go science, you will win. The only other thing that other players can do is also try to win by science or to try to take as many to scrolls as they can from you. But if you're only getting one reward at a time for every precious card that you play, that makes that viable. Definitely, you can still win by going heavy science, but not any more than any other route, at least that I have found. I won one of the games by going circles and by and uh, the sets, like the scroll, shield, and uh, science, and getting 12 points that way as well. And I, someone else that we played with did very, very well playing the law cards that give a lot of points. So I, again, because of that one stupid major rule that we got wrong, so, you know, so many other things sort of clicked into, pl into place on my future plays, and I really enjoy Viceroy now. Because I enjoyed the core gameplay even originally, and now with those issues gone, the game just sings. It's fast, it's, you know, got good, sort of puzzly, addictive set collecting going on. It's And it looks good, it's solid, even despite, again, admittedly, having a paste it on theme. There's just something about building a pyramid of cards and then you have all these different decisions to make. It's like, not just, you know, again, I, I, as I mentioned many times in the past, I love games where I can use a card for multiple things, where a card means different things depending on how I play it. And that's never been more uh, at, there's never been more of that happening than in Viceroy, because not only is it what reward am I going to get and where do I build it in order to get the reward that I want from this card and what's it going to cost me, it's also uh, how do I place this card in order to complete circles as much as possible. I really want the reward on this card, but it doesn't fit into my tableau here at all. I'll be missing out on points for that and I'll be setting myself up to not be able to get more points in the future, but how far ahead do I want to think about that? I need these resources right now. Sometimes you're going to play a card just to get a bunch of gems, which you can use to play more cards. But then again, if you complete a circle, you get a free gem as well. That's also something we screwed up in my original review. Sorry. But there's all these different considerations to uh, take into account. Like you could just go heavily, heavy, heavy into gem resources at the beginning of the game and setting yourself up to be able to play more cards in the future. But if you're doing that, you're not playing cards that are explicitly getting you points or doing things like getting the scrolls and the science and the uh, potentially sets of tokens in order to get you the more points. Uh, so it, there's, uh, there's sort of back and forth to take into account. Now also originally in my original review, I thought that swords were not as big of a deal, but they are a pretty big deal because in our last couple of games, the point threshold was much lower. So losing four points for every sword that someone has is a huge deal and there's not as many shields flying around. So that's an interesting dynamic there. I still wish there was maybe bonuses for uh, swords just so that you yourself can be gaining 
points off of them instead of just screwing somebody else. Because just because you're screwing someone else out of points doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to uh, elevate yourself that much. There still could be a third player who had enough shields to block out your swords who is going to be above you. So not that I think the game needs more tokens, but maybe a little bit more of a reward for uh, going the sword route and having swords be more plentiful might have been a cool idea. But, you know, the other routes are perfectly viable. I love going for the circle rocks. I just love trying to puzzle those things together. Trying to get the different sets of tokens is also interesting as well because you can completely ignore getting scroll bonus tokens if you want and just use the scrolls as the third component of your sets because you get 12%, which is huge. It's not easy to do. You're going to have to diversify much more. But then again, you're getting good stuff for getting shields. You're protecting yourself. And for science, which you get a few science tokens under your belt, everyone, almost everyone inevitably, unless you're totally going for uh, the resource cards to give you more gemstones, which might mean that you're going to lose, inevitably someone's going to have to pass. And if you built up a few science by then, that's a huge leg up. I had science enough science built one time that I passed and got seven gems which was enough at that time in the game to actually cause a shortage of, I think, those blues or greens, which was great, in addition to giving me a ton of stuff I could use to spend on cards. And there's just a lot of cool things going on in that development phase. Even the auction phase, though, is really solid, because I don't typically like bidding in auctions. It's one of my least favorite game mechanisms. But this is fast, and it's relatively painless. Now, you might have to... Uh, give up a gem and get nothing in return if you if more than one player puts forth the same gem Which does sting but it adds an interesting dynamic to the game because first thing is you can say whatever you want during that phase You can say look I'm holding out a yellow gem Okay Now if anyone at that point still puts out a yellow gem without saying anything They're a bastard and they just screwed you out of getting a card or at least you had to give up another gem but you could always negotiate and say, well, okay, fine, I'll go for this one instead, but later on I want you to remember that. You know, this isn't really in the rules per se, but I think it's we've done that and it kind of adds a fun element to it. Especially when it comes to the point where there's the second chance auction card and the current auction card on the same color. Both people, hold, two people specifically hold out gems of the same color. And it's like, oh, well, okay, I want this guy here. Oh, you want that guy too? Well, let's see. I don't think so. Maybe I'll owe you one or you owe me one. I'll let you have it now. Or you know what? No, eh, I don't think so. I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to let you have it. And then nobody gets anything. So interesting dynamics going on in the auction, but still at the same time, relatively simple and painless. You're going to get something, even if it's just gems, which is going to set you up for a better run next time. <sighs> so, look, there's a lot going on in this game, despite how small the box is. It's a lot of fun, and I'm sorry that I screwed it up the first time because I was really missing out, and I want to play it more and more now. I love the whole element of building up the pyramid and getting these different items, and I love uh, just the artwork of the game, just how it looks and how it feels. It's just a ton of fun. Definitely lived up to the hype. That is Viceroy from Mayday Games and Hobby World. Check it out. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.